I was at the final point of my science academic studies when I realized that I enjoy working with people much more than I do with test tubes. So I handed in my PhD thesis, and some 13 years after I had left high school, I returned, this time as a biology teacher. Now, during those 13 years, exciting things were happening in the world. We started making babies through IVF. People started finding their way around with the assistance of GPS. Microsoft filled our world with windows. The World Wide Web became a household member. And Prozac was introduced, making the world look much nicer and easier to be in. I walked into the classroom, and within two seconds, I understood the change that had happened there. Once we used to write with white chalk on a black board. Now I was asked to write with a black marker on a white board. Big change, huge. Two things happened during that week, uh, first week back at high school. First, the principal of the school called me in for a meeting. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a teacher or a student. When the principal calls you in, you go. He called me in, and he looked at my credentials, and he said, hmm, let's establish that you know biology. You're probably an expert in biology, but that doesn't make you a biology teacher yet. Go study some education. It's a profession. Since that day, some 26 years later, I am still studying education. He was right. It is a multidisciplinary, ever-developing, fascinating profession. The second thing that happened, happened when I went into my very first 10th grade biology class. I introduced myself naturally, and I watched the students as their eyes started growing wider and wider until when I told them I hold a PhD in molecular biology, one of them just couldn't hold it in anymore. And he looked at me and exclaimed, what on earth are you doing here? Sadly, not to say tragically, he had implemented the unquestionable truth that had been sent to him as a message by the system ever since early childhood. If a person is well-educated and successful, they won't choose to become a mere teacher. More than that, if you consider a person well-educated and successful, you're not worthy to have him as a teacher. Education just wasn't perceived as inspiring enough, important enough, or desirable enough. Now, in the years that have passed since then, I understood that this shouldn't have come as a surprise to me. In a world where growing diversity, uncertainty, and rapid changes have become our everyday lives, if you look at the education system, it is still very much highly standardized, rigid, dealing with outdated processes. We ask our teachers and our students to deal with facts and figures more than anything else in a world where facts and figures are not only ubiquitous, and exponentially growing by the hour, but they're actually available and free. More than that, our education systems are still trying to prepare our young for jobs in a world where, in 10 years, as we heard this morning, we have no idea which jobs are going to be available, which jobs won't exist anymore. We don't even stop to ask ourselves an even more basic question. In this day and age, should job preparation still even be one of the goals of education? Our frustration isn't new. It's been going on for decades. If you go back 150 years to Lewis Carroll, he already said that that's why we call them lessons, because they lessen every day. That frustration has led us to create and implement one reform after the other into the system until the point that we are now reform infested. You look at the education systems and you can find reforms galore. Some people are talking about the future of education lies in changing the learning place. 
Others will tell you what we need to change is to bring in more technology into the classroom. Some will speak about innovative pedagogies, and some will talk about that one incredible element that sits within each and every one of us, be a student or child or teacher. Let's develop that element, and then everything will be hunky-dory, be it creativity, be it imagination, maybe the element of grit. Whatever you think of, that one thing will change the, the uh, system. Well, as many reforms as we have, we're still frustrated. We still look at our education systems and say, something isn't working. The impact that we're looking for hasn't happened yet. Maybe because in this day and age, what we're looking for in our education system isn't another reform. We don't need another reform. What we need is a revolution, no less. We need a change of paradigm of what our education systems are and should be. We need to leave the comfort zone of what we know. Stop trying to juggle those building blocks that are, not, that are falling apart right around us and try to build something new. If in the 21st century we're talking about developing active, creative, innovative students who know how to work in flexible and sustainable teams, then the education system itself needs to role model exactly that. The system itself, be it its teachers, its students, or its processes, needs to be a system that is active, creative, innovative, and works in flexible and sustainable teams. So how do we do that? What should we do in order to achieve such a system? Let's look back in history for approximately 75 years and go back to January 6th, 1941. In January 6, 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave his State of the Nation address. It has since then become known as the Four Freedoms Speech. The Four Freedoms Speech spoke about the very basic four human rights that each and every person on the planet, regardless of nationality, regardless of geography, has to have as his, basic, his or her basic human right. Let's use that as a baseline and talk about the four freedoms of education. What are the four basic rights that each and every one of us in this room, in other rooms, all over the world, have as a right when we enter an education system, regardless if we're a student or a teacher? The first freedom is the freedom from coverage. We are slaves of our curriculums, times, and spaces. One of the worst enemies of education is the need to cover the subjects of a curriculum that is set and standardized by someone who has decided that this is what we need to learn. But in a world where we can learn whatever we want, whenever we want, wherever we want, these change are no less than ridiculous. The second freedom is freedom from standardization. We're also slaves of the standards that we have defined that each of us has to accomplish. We run from test to test, whether it's in the classroom or on the national level or comparing internationally, but evaluation and assessment should be about forming the process, designing it, not about measuring one student and comparing him to the other. Instead of that, we should develop meaningful and emotionally charged creative uses of knowledge. Standardization kills creativity, destroys individuality, and represses one of the most important things that leads to education, and that is wonder and our natural tendency to explore and discover. It also leads to another thing that we need to be free of. We are afraid to fail. We fear failure. We should have the freedom to fail. Failure is part of life. If you don't doubt and you don't question, you won't fail. You probably won't succeed either. Churchill used to say that success is going from one failure to the other without losing enthusiasm. Good cultivated, harnessed failure 
can be used to ignite imagination, to provoke thought, and it also leads to one more quality that we've somehow lost along the way, and that is the quality of humility. Who we are, what our real place in this world is, what our responsibilities should be towards ourselves, towards our peers, and towards the environment. That humility is a value that only if we try and fail and try again until we work it out, we can develop. And the last freedom, the fourth one, is the freedom to imagine. We are the storytelling, symbol-creating, product-designing species on this planet. We love the stories and the visions and the imaginations and what they make us feel. We love the mysteries and the wonders that are around us. We like to hear about the heroes and the heroines, the villains, the role models that we can follow their footsteps. Interaction between imagination and implementation leads to human development. Isn't that what we're looking for in our education systems? These four freedoms need to be expressed in the education systems through three major arts that must be developed. Education arts. First, the art of active knowledge. We need to find ways to walk ourselves through all the available mass of information that surrounds us everywhere, know how to harness that information, turn it into our own knowledge, and to use it to use it in flexible, sometimes unknown and uncertain circumstances. We also know, need to know how to use it responsibly. Today, information and knowledge are available for all. Our kids can reach and find anything they want. Do we really teach them what to look for, how to think critically about what they find, what to use, and what not to use? The second art is the art of storytelling. As I said, we live in our stories. Everything that surrounds us used to be a story, something that someone envisioned. Who are those people? What, did they what were they thinking when they discovered what they discovered? Why did they search for what they were searching for? How does it impact my life? What can I do with it? This story with its wonders and mysteries is the, probably the best teacher on Earth. But we don't use stories in the classroom. All those facts and figures that we deal with, do we tell them as igniting stories that motivate us, make us want to learn more and more about the story? I don't remember my geography class. I do remember that most of the time I was staring at maps. They were trying to teach me these lines, the longitude lines, the latitude lines, which kind of map should compare to the other? This is an economic map, that's a physical map. And then one day, I learned the story of John Harrison, the clockmaker who actually solved the greatest problem of the 19th century, how to find longitude at sea. It was an incredible story, and my imagination was racing. I read the book, I went to, see, to listen to the lecture of the author who wrote it, Dava Sobel. I went back to those maps that I did not remember from geography, and the very first opportunity that I had, I went to Greenwich in London, right outside of London, to see the clocks that Harrison had made to solve the prog problem of longitude. The story made me learn much more than any class in geography had during high school. And finally, the art of socialization. We are a social species. We operate in societies that operate through their norms, our beliefs, and our values. Too, it's too easy, and there's a fine line to go in education from socialization that develops your thinking, about those values and norms, and deciding what you want to do with them and how you want to implement them in your life, the fine line between that and between dangerous indoctrination. During the 21st century, if you just look around us, that danger is evident almost every single day. 
the art of socialization of our children and of our teachers and not indoctrination is something we need to develop. And last but not least, we need to go back to the good old five WH questions of first grade. What is worthy of teaching? Who are we teaching? Who are our students? Where have they come from? Who are the teachers that we want to teach them? Where and when does education occur best? Is a one age, 45 to 90 minute, specific classroom slot the best way to educate? Maybe not. If not, what is? And finally, probably the trickiest question of all, why are we teaching what we're teaching? That's a tricky question. Are we teaching what we're teaching because of historical reasons? It's a reason. Because we've always done it like this, so we should do it again? Because we're not frustrated or too frustrated? Are we teaching what we're teaching because of the pressure of interest groups, political values? The question why we teach what we're teaching is one of the most crucial questions of education. Try answering it candidly and honestly. You might be surprised by what you find. 200 years of frustration have led us to understand that it's time to move from viewing education, as most of the time we do, a being about encyclopedias. It's time to move on and understand that education isn't about an encyclopedia. It's about the greatest adventure on Earth. Thank you. Thank you.